Okay, well, welcome everyone to today's paediatric teaching. Um, I wanted today to talk about dengue. It's an interesting and important disease. It's not um, one of the most common causes of fever or disease in children, but it's important because it's probably increasing. And also it's important because it can teach us something about uh, pathophysiology and uh, and shock and supportive care and resuscitation um, and also some things about public health and uh, and prevention. So we'll make a start on a discussion about dengue and I hope today that we'll be able to do a few things in terms of learning about about dengue. I would like to pro pro discuss the dengue in general about its uh, virology and to, for you to have some sort of understanding of the immunopathology and the immunology of uh, dengue is complex and interesting but it can teach us something about antibodies about t-cell function and about toxin mediated disease that's the three things i want you to focus on and in dengue, many children have this increase in vascular permeability, sometimes called a capillary leak syndrome, other, and, and it's manifest as edema. And to understand why that happens and also why it happens in other diseases is important because we see lots of children with edema um, from infections or sepsis and, uh, and to understand why that happens is useful. To know the clinical signs and importantly, the differential diagnosis of dengue because dengue can look like lots of other diseases, whether it's influenza or viral exanthems or bacterial sepsis or malaria, it can look very similar to, to other diseases. And to understand something about the fluid management and supportive care of, of dengue and, uh, uh, and cases of varying severity. So it'll be a mixture of clinical and pathophysiological mostly today. But first of all, the virology and the entomology, um, I'm sure you all know that dengue is a flavivirus that's transmitted mostly by Aedes aegypti mosquito. And uh, the, the Aedes aegypti mosquito has been around for hundreds of years. It was first um, emerged in the 15th century, throughout the 15th to the 19th century, there was increased trade throughout the world. And particularly the slave trade that spread um, dengue, the Aedes aegypti mosquito from Africa to Asia, especially through the tropical regions there. In the 20th century, there's been even more globalized trade and it's been found that the eggs and the immature forms of uh, Aedes aegypti is dispersed widely on container ships, especially in used car tires. That's been the mechanism by which they feel that most, uh, a lot of the dengue transmission has occurred and also the travel of viremic people, people who are relatively asymptomatic but might be viremic can travel from one place to another and uh, and where, where there's uh, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, they can uh, transmit that to other people. The, the rapid urbanisation in many countries has meant that there's one increased number of vector breeding sites, like lots more water bodies within cities where there's crowded um, uh, crowded families and communities. And uh, um, and that all leads, all of that leads to uh, the spread of it. There has more recently been a secondary vector emerge, and that's Aedes albopictus. And that seems to be particularly well adapted to, uh, to, to urban environments. Um, so for all of those reasons, and because uh, the climate is changing, and the uh, the, uh, uh, the the areas in the world where um, Aedes aegypti can live is increasing, then uh, dengue will become more of a problem uh, in years to come. Let's talk about the disease, you know, the clinical aspects of the disease. The incubation period is somewhere between four and ten days. So anyone who's been in an area where there um, may be Aedes aegypti and dengue is at risk of it even after 10 days or or or, or even two weeks after um, they uh, uh, they've been in that area because the um, many children present with up to two to seven days of high fever but, so they may well have been exposed to it two weeks before they often present with high fever you any any people who've had dengue will know how painful it is you get headaches 
uh, retroorbital pain, muscle aches and pains, nausea, vomiting, and sometimes come out in a rash. And the uh, the the symptoms can look very much like a very severe influenza episode or even COVID nineteen uh, virus uh, can look rather seem rather similar in many ways. The rash is a red rash. It looks very much like other viral exanthems, uh, looks similar to measles or rubella or enterovirus. Uh, many uh, children have con conjunctival injection when they've got dengue, and that's not dissimilar to adenovirus, which also causes a rash and a very high fever. So there's lots of different, the differential diagnosis includes lots of different rashes. Um, to distinguish from influenza and some of the other uh, viruses, dengue has no respiratory symptoms, at least not in the initial stages. Like the children don't have fever and cough and coryza. If they've got fever, cough, coryza and, and a rash, it's more likely to be influenza or measles or something like that rather than dengue. So uh, that, that's, a, that's a clue, I think, to distinguish it from many other um, respiratory viruses that are associated with rash. This is the rash of dengue. And this is a young boy who had dengue uh, fever. And you can see it's an erythematous, uh, fine, sometimes coarse maculopapular rash. Um, there are some characteristics of it that are not very specific, such as the if you do the tourniquet test, that is put a, a tourniquet on the arm. Sometimes you'll see petechiae uh, occurring below the tourniquet. That really is, um, it's, it's a test both for capillary fragility and also thrombocytopenia. And so it's not very specific. I'll just show you, look at that rash of a child with dengue and then look at this rash, the next rash of a child who I looked after just a few days ago. It looks remarkably similar. You can imagine this child might have dengue, but in fact, this child's got group A streptococcal septic shock. So uh, the, the rash of dengue and the rash of measles and rubella and other viral exanthems can look very similar. There can be, there are obviously differences with uh, with measles, but it can look very similar to other infections like this, this child had group A streptococcal septic shock. The classification of dengue is, is uh, uh, now in three parts, dengue fever or dengue with warning signs or emergency signs, and then severe dengue with either dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue shock syndrome. And, and there's been several different classifications over the years, but I think that it's a spectrum really between just a febrile illness to a febrile illness in a child who seems re, you know quite unwell to, uh, to severe dengue where there's shock or um, uh, coagulopathy. In, uh, in severe dengue, there is usually, as I said, it's a spectrum from just fever to more severe signs of viremia or sepsis. J just in the same way that bacteria can cause sepsis, then viruses can cause sepsis. And dengue, a very bad dengue episode, is not dissimilar to um, sepsis in many ways. The child often feels very weak. They have may have significant abdominal symptoms, um, uh, vomiting because of uh, bowel edema often, they may be uh, tachypneic. They may have a coagulopathy and have bleeding gums and fatigue. They'll be restless. Um, uh, they may have bloody diarrhea and they may vomit. And, and the, these are all just um, generalized signs of severe viremia or uh, severe sepsis. The, they're the symptoms the children have. And then in very severe dengue, there's, as I said, capillary leak and a fluid shift from the intravascular compartment into the interstitial space where you get edema, not only of the limbs, but also in the pleural space in the, within the lung itself, increased ascites. And so the, this fluid shifts out from the capillaries because of capillary leak, which I'll explain the reasons why. And that all causes respiratory distress, the the coagulopathy and the falling platelet count can lead to mucosal bleeding of the gastrointestinal tract and they can go into organ failure. And I'll speak a bit about the organ failure of dengue, particularly kidney failure and acute kidney injury uh, soon. When the fluid is leaking out of the intravascular space, then the red cells stay in. So the hematocrit increases. 
you need to understand the the source of any arising hematocrit and a falling platelet count. And the rising hematocrit occurs because of the leak of plasma from the intravascular space into the interstitial space and therefore just leaving red cells. That's why the hematocrit increases. The platelet count falls because of varemia, just like uh, in some other conditions, like in uh, bad other bad viral infections or, or, or sepsis, you get um, thrombocytopenia. And the thrombocytopenia leads to uh, gastric gastrointestinal bleeding and bleeding in other sites and that positive tourniquet test that I mentioned before. <clears throat> the... Uh, transaminases of the liver will often rise and the albumin often falls. And the album, albumin, the serum albumin will fall because of leak of, uh, because of capillary leak. The capillaries leak serum. They don't, they leak serum and protein. They don't leak red cells, but they lose leak serum and protein. And also because of proteinuria. Many children, more than half of all the children with, with dengue of a severe degree have proteinuria so they'll be leaking protein a bit like nephrotic syndrome so in some ways it can look like a very acute severe nephrotic syndrome with hemorrhage um, again just just like a severe multi-organ uh, dysfunction from sepsis one of the other characteristic features that you need to look for in children with bad dengue is a very narrow pulse pressure um, when children have bacterial sepsis often they have a wide pulse pressure they have a bounding pulse but if they have dengue or they have severe hypovolemia, then their pulse pressure will be very narrow. And that's because the fluid is leaked out of the intravascular compartment. So the amount of fluid in the, in the intravascular, it's like they're dehydrated. But so they often have a very narrow pulse pressure. And then they may get sudden hypotension. So beware the child who's got a narrow pulse pressure, uh, such as 90 on 70. That that, that uh, even though the blood pressure seems to be okay, they they are intravascularly volume depletes and they may become suddenly hypotensive. As I mentioned, they may have gastrointestinal hemorrhage, both from uh, coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia, um, also because of bowel ischemia that can occur in shock. If you've got shock, then the blood flow to the bowel shuts down somewhat and to divert blood to the uh, major organs, to the heart and the brain, and, and can cause gastrointestinal hemorrhage. So in the most severe forms of dengue and in dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue shock syndrome, that's what um, you get. I, I mentioned the, the tourniquet test. Um, what you do is inflate a blood pressure cuff on the arm, just as you normally would, between systolic and diastolic. That is between their systolic and diastolic pressure and leave it for about five minutes. Now, mostly a child won't develop um, uh, a particular spots, but if they've got low platelets or if they've got capillary fragility, that is if their capillaries are fragile because of the viremia, then they may develop um, these particular hemorrhages. It's, uh, it's common in dengue hemorrhagic fever, um, but it also can occur in other forms of sepsis where you have thrombocytopenia or a coagulopathy. So it's not very specific for dengue, but it certainly is found in dengue. It's useful to do. Now, I want to say something about the, the um, virology and the pathophysiology of dengue, because it does help us understand a bit about how viruses work and how they cause disease. Dengue is a little bit different to some other viruses, Oops. And, and I think it's useful to sort of understand that. Firstly, let's go to the, the basics of how viruses work. Unlike bacteria, viruses can only replicate in, um, in a human if they're intracellular. If the virus can't get into the cells, then it can't replicate. And that's because the virus uses the host machinery that uses the endoplasmic reticulum and the... Uh, the enzymes for DNA replication to make new viruses. So some there are some intracellular bacteria, but some bacteria can replicate um, outside cells. Most, most can replicate outside cells, but viruses can only replicate if they're inside the cells. So therefore, it, it makes sense that the ease with which a virus can enter a cell 
influences the amount of viral replication. And so some viruses can rapidly enter cells and therefore they're likely to, to replicate rapidly and produce a lot of other viruses, whereas some viruses have more trouble entering the cell. So it's the degree, the ease with which a virus can enter the cell that influences the amount of viral replication and therefore influences the severity of the infection. So to understand dengue, you have to understand something about the antibodies that are produced during dengue. And there are two types of antibodies that I'll describe. You need to know something about the T cell responses that you get in a child who's got dengue, and then something about dengue toxin. And these might seem obscure concepts, but if you can understand this, then I think you can understand a lot about immunity to infectious diseases and also the way some other both dengue and some other infectious diseases work in terms of their effect on the immune system. As, as we know, we for most viruses, whether it's measles or rubella or chickenpox, varicella, we produce neutralizing antibodies. If we're exposed to the virus, we produce protective antibodies. Most Mostly, that's what we do. And those antibodies bind with the virus if exposed to the virus again, and uh, protect um, uh, protect the the um, have a immunoprotective effect and reduce the um, the the rate at which a virus can enter a cell and replicate, or it triggers a uh, cascade of the inflammatory um, process within the body that leads to killing of the virus, consumption of the virus by macrophages or or enzyme. Um, uh, production within the cytosol of neutrophils and the release of those enzymes that kill the virus. So the the fact that we produce antibodies to whether it's COVID or measles or or influenza um, because of previous exposure to the virus or because of immunization means that we're protected against the virus getting into cells and replicating, and also it helps our immune system deal with the virus. In dengue, we do produce some neutralizing antibodies, but we also produce some cross-reacting non-neutralizing antibodies that actually enhance the virus entering the cell. And that's that's the reason for the long uh, observed um, uh, phenomenon where a if a child gets a second episode of dengue, especially if it's from a different serotype, they are more likely to have a more severe disease. They're much more likely to have dengue shock syndrome or dengue um, hemorrhagic fever if their second episode is of a, a from a dengue virus that have a, has a different serotype. And that is because the some of the antibodies that are produced are cross-reacting, non-neutralizing antibodies. In fact, they're enhancing. So... This concept of antibody-dependent enhancement is reasonably easy to understand if you understand what, what antibodies normally do, and that is provide some protection against cell penetration, or they provide some trigger for the immune system to deal with the virus. Normally, with a primary infection, you have normal virus replication. It just it, it enters the cell and it can replicate if... Um, uh, with, the, with the organelles of the cell. But when you've got a secondary infection, in the presence of these antibody-dependent enhancement antibodies, then you can have much more rapid uh, entering of the, of the cell by the virus because the, the, the combination of the virus and immunoglobulin binds to the receptors on macrophages and monocytes and and the virus then can enter the cell a hundredfold greater or at least lead to a, a hundredfold increase in virus production and that can that leads to enhanced disease severity so more likely that the child or the adult will have a more severe form of dengue with their second episode of dengue and with uh, especially if it's a different um, uh, one of the different four strains of dengue, uh, different four serotypes. Um, it leads to antibody-dependent enhancement, enhancing a viral replication within the cell and therefore enhanced, uh, <clears throat> enhanced effect.
there's also so you know that the immune system is broken into two parts if you like i mean there's many parts there's our protective barrier there's antibodies that's called the humoral immune system and then there's T cell immune system, which is called our cellular immune system. And then the T cells are broken into those that have uh, memory T cells and then the first responders, if you like. And what a secondary infection does is with, with dengue is to enhance the pro inflammatory response. So normally our memory cells can lead to a, a, increased inflammatory response that deals with the virus rather rapidly. But in dengue, sometimes there's an enhanced pro-inflammatory response that leads to more inflammation. So it may there are some cytokines that are stimulated by T memory cells. Remember, these are the lymphocytes that stimulate the uh, that are stimulated by the virus if they've if they've been exposed to the virus before. And they can st stimulate the release of interleukin-6, which is particularly a cytokine that leads to lots of high fever and capillary leak syndrome. So the main thing to know is that both for antibodies and for the T cells, there can be, instead of it being reducing the severity of an infection, it can enhance the inflammation, the inflammatory response to a, to a second infection. There's also a, a diminished antiviral immune response. And so when um, T memory cells encounter the virus for the second time, then instead of producing lots of interferon, which is a uh, viral killing uh, chemical, that, that interferon levels drop. And so that leads to, again, increased viral replication. I won't go through this in too much detail, but just the concept that the second virus can be worse than the first is important and and it's possible to understand why that is to, uh, based on the different immune response that uh, the children can get to the second virus it's the second exposure to dengue virus especially if it's a different one of the different four serotypes the the effect of all of that um is this vascular permeability syndrome or capillary leak and and it's manifest the tourniquet test is partly a test of thrombocytopenia but also partly a test of capillary fragility and in the in the in this stage of dengue in this febrile stage when the child's very has a high fever and is starting to get edematous that's when a third part of the of the inflammatory response to dengue is active and that's the the dengue virus protein. And so far, I've talked about host immunity, so antibodies and T cells. But the dengue virus itself produces a protein, which is called a non-structural protein, NS1. And that leads to a heightened inflammatory response, particularly the cytokine I mentioned before called IL-6, which regulates fever. If you get a lot of IL-6 circulating, that's what causes the fever and that occurs in sepsis and other forms of viremia so uh, this non-structural protein that's produced by the dengue virus is stimulates the immune system to cause for capillary leak and uh, and that leads to leakage of serum and and uh, plasma into the interstitial fluid leads to low levels of albumin and therefore edema and pleural effusions and ascites, and of course the increased hematocrit that you see in uh, severe dengue. So all the clinical manifestations of dengue that we see and can recognize are related to these inflammatory responses caused by the, the virus, the non-structural protein toxin and the antibody response and the T-cell immune response. So, as I said, who's at risk of severe dengue? It used to be that we saw very little severe dengue in, in PNG. I think there's more in the last 10 years than what the previously was. And it and it was thought that the reason why there was mostly mostly dengue just caused fever and not um, uh, other more severe manifestations. 
like dengue shock syndrome and dengue hemorrhagic fever was because there was most children only got one episode of dengue. They didn't get a second one. And there was a limited number of dengue virus serotypes in PNG. But certainly there's been significant dengue outbreaks in the last few years. Certainly in the Solomon Islands, there's also been major dengue outbreaks where there's been many children get dengue shock syndrome and dengue hemorrhagic fever. And in Indonesia, there's been uh, frequent severe dengue outbreaks in the last decade that have led to many children getting uh, shock syndrome and hemorrhagic um, hemorrhagic disease. So it's probably, dengue is probably functioning now in this part of uh, the Pacific a bit more like it did uh, in the rest of Asia 10 and 20 years ago. So I think we'll, we will see more um, uh, of the severe clinical manifestations of dengue Who's at risk? Well, children who become infected with the second dengue serotype after the initial primary dengue infection. Remember, the primary one causes usually just fever and rash, but the the secondary dengue infection causes the more severe disease, uh, typically speaking. Um, if you're an infant with a, a primary dengue, then they may be, have severe disease as well. Um, and that might be because the mother had um, uh, non-neutralizing antibodies. And it's interesting, while um, in terms of the antibodies that cross the placenta, there are some short-acting ones for dengue, and they're the neutralizing antibodies. So the protective ones are relatively short-acting. They, they, they diminish after a couple of months. But the non-neutralizing antibodies that I that I mentioned lead to an enhanced viral replication, more virus getting into the cells, they seem to last for longer in a, in a baby. And so if you see a baby, an infant in the uh, six or seven months who's got, who's got dengue, then they can have a severe episode of dengue with hemorrhagic shock or with um, a dengue shock syndrome because they may still have some of their mother's non-neutralizing antibodies. The secondary infections, it's been said that there's a 40 times risk of dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, I think it's a much, much higher risk, whether it's 40 or 4. It's still a very much increased risk of dengue shock syndrome and dengue hemorrhagic fever. There are hundreds more children get a primary infection with just fever than those children who get dengue shock syndrome and dengue hemorrhagic fever. I'll just go through the care of children with dengue. And it's the same as the care of any seriously ill child. You, if you follow the um, standard stages of management of any sick child, that will enable you to look after a child who's got dengue. So triage, emergency treatment, history and examination, laboratory investigations, the main diagnosis, and then thinking about the differential diagnosis, providing treatment, giving supportive care, monitoring, and then discharge planning and follow-up. If you follow those stages of management, you can't go wrong. In triage, very relevant to dengue and many other children who come in with critical illness, you need to identify the emergency signs if they have them. So take a brief history of the presenting problem. Usually children present with a high fever, maybe um, weakness, lethargy, vomiting, diarrhea, like I said, uh, rash, take their temperature and weigh the child and then go through the process of identifying if the child's got emergency signs. So listen for strider or obstructed breathing, look for cyanosis and other signs of respiratory distress, such as chest in drawing or tracheal tug, check their oxygen saturations, feel the skin temperature of the hands and feet and feel the pulse for its volume. This is important because in dengue, a narrow pulse pressure is very uh, uh, indicative of severe disease. And also the same with any form of sepsis, a narrow pulse pressure. If you're feeling uh, a pulse, measuring the blood pressure and the pulse pressure is narrow, or you're feeling the pulses and the pulses are weak, or the, hand, the, hands, the hands and feet are cold, or the capillary refill time is prolonged, then the child may be in shock. You should assess the child for lethargy and their level of interaction. That, that's what you do at triage. We've been through that before with many different cases. Then specifically check for 
if a child's got a high fever, this is part of your triage or your early assessment. But if you suspect dengue, then check for dengue warning signs or the emergency signs related to dengue. So that could be any emergency sign, like I've mentioned. It could be the other warning signs with dengue are if a child's got abdominal pain, which that can be for many reasons. They can have congestive hepatomegaly because of because of leakage of fluid into the into the liver, so their liver's enlarged, or they may have some bowel ischemia or some gastrointestinal um, uh, edema, and that can all cause abdominal pain. They may have vomiting, or they might have generalized edema, so check their feet for edema, feet and, and legs for edema. If they've got respiratory distress or petechiae or bruising or bleeding or any signs of capillary fragility, or if they're lethargic or oliguric, or if their hematocrit is high, higher than normal, or if their plate count is low. They're all the warning signs that the child might be having a severe episode of dengue, and they, they're indications the child should be admitted to hospital and provided with supportive care and close monitoring and uh, um, to, to uh, prevent the consequences of, of, of dengue. When you're seeing a child with suspected dengue, then you also should consider the differential diagnosis so I went through this before when I showed the rash, but of course, in the fever and rash stage, then there are many different diseases that can look the same. So malaria because of a high fever, measles and rubella because of fever and rash, enterovirus or adenovirus or influenza because of rash and fever and systemic illness. Often these children are systemically unwell. But as I showed you, that picture of the child who just a few days ago had group A streptococcal infection, that looks very much like dengue, the dengue rash, uh, um, a toxic shock rash. And, uh, and, and so we should also think whether the child could have bacterial sepsis as well as dengue and, and manage the child the same. Many children with dengue, at least advanced dengue, have pleural effusions, and that can also be because they've got you know, a group A streptococcal pneumonia or pneumococcal pneumonia or staph aureus infection. So again, we're looking at the differential diagnosis, including other gram-positive infections, other gram-positive bacterial infections like group A strep, staph aureus and pneumococcus. Typhoid, a gram-negative infection, can cause fever and also, of course, sometimes causes rash and it could be uh, mistaken for dengue. And then there's other arboviral or flavivirus infections like chikungunya virus that can cause the fever and systemic unwellness and muscle aches and pains and joint pains. That 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 can also and a rash, uh, uh, Murray Valley encephalitis. There's a variety of different viruses that can look rather similar to dengue and occur in outbreaks. So you need to think about the possible differential diagnosis when you see patients. And at least at the start, manage children for all the ones that you need to. So that might require, for example, giving antibiotics for the possibility of bacterial sepsis. It might require giving vitamin A in, in case the child's got measles, the, the, making sure you cover typhoid until you get the until you get the diagnosis. The investigations are really based around the clinical picture and the differential diagnosis that's possible. Some, some diseases may be able to be ruled out because they are not currently around at the moment, but I think it's also it's very useful to think about that differential diagnosis and do the tests that you need to do, like tests for dengue, but also tests for other diseases that might look the same. There, there are um, uh, several different serological tests or viral particle tests for dengue and the most useful one is a dengue virus PCR. That's really just finding viral particles in the blood. There are some other tests like a dengue virus IgM. That's an antibody. That's not very specific. And it often occurs quite late for um, in dengue. And, it, and so while IgM will tell you that the child probably has had dengue recently, it may occur too late to be positive for um, uh, uh, to to help clinically. Um, there is some in some places that um, non-structural protein 
can be tested for the the antigen which is a non-structural protein that that can be tested for but not everywhere mostly it's dengue viral pcr and uh dengue serology which is uh not as specific and and occurs late the usually the clinical picture can give you a good clue and and especially the high hematocrit and the thrombocytopenia if you see that coupled with a fever and a rash um, like I showed you, a very high hematocrit and a low platelet count, then you should think, well, this looks very much like dengue. Sometimes instead of having a high white cell count, just like in severe sepsis, there can be a, a low white cell count. So leukopenia is common in severe dengue. You should take a blood culture to look for other bacteria like staph or strep. Um, and if you see a child with dengue and you can measure their albumin level then if they've got edema often their albumin level will be quite low it might be 15 or 12 or so usually under 20 you should measure their creatinine and urea because dengue can cause acute kidney injury and it has major consequences for how you manage these patients so measure their urine output and if you can measure their creatinine and urea it helps if you've got a um if you can measure whether or not a child's got a metabolic acidosis, but that's not always possible. But many children with dengue present, when they present with dengue shock, will have a metabolic acidosis. And, and on a chest X-ray, they may have a pleural effusion, which can look very similar to pneumonia with empyema or pneumonia with effusion or even TB with an effusion. There, there are several stages of dengue. And for most children with a primary infection, they go no further than the febrile stage. They just get a fever, maybe a rash, and they are, and then they get better. But if the if they have are at risk of having dengue shock syndrome or dengue hemorrhagic fever, then there's more to come. And and as their as their fever progresses, then they may get a rising hematocrit because of leakage of, of uh, plasma out of the capillaries into the interstitial space, and they may get a falling in their platelet count. And this is their, that when they reach a critical stage, they're having a rising hematocrit and a falling platelet count. These are major um, uh, warning signs. Um, they, sometimes the fevers defervesce by that stage uh, when, when they have these other manifestations and it's, as I said, it's only later often that the IgM and the IgG rise. So measuring their serology at the time uh, may not help too much. This is a child who had dengue and has a pleural effusion. You wouldn't know just by looking at the x-ray that they didn't have pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia or, or um, group A streptococcal pneumonia. They've clearly got an effusion. They've got a white out of the of the base of the right lung with a uh, a meniscus sign. This is clearly an effusion. And similarly with this child, clearly he's got a, a large, again with dengue, a, a large pleural effusion, um, uh, in, in a, but, but indistinguishable from some other bacterial pneumonia. The treatment of dengue is to do the investigations that I mentioned Try to control the fever as best as you can. Um, giving paracetamol helps unless they've got major liver dysfunction. Don't give aspirin or ibuprofen because they may increase the bleeding risk if the child's got thrombocytopenia. Um, usually, if a child's being managed as an outpatient, you should review them every day until the fever resolves because you need to monitor them for the warning signs of dengue, severe dengue. And so best to review them every day. If they've got warning signs or they've got emergency signs, then they need to be admitted and they need good supportive care with analgesia and fluids and respiratory and circulatory support. There is no, of course, in, there's no antiviral or antibiotic that will work in dengue, but most of it is, most of the care is about good supportive care and monitoring for complications. And so you, the complications you should monitor for each day are the warning signs, signs of shock, signs of bleeding, presence of pleural effusions, presence of pulmonary congestion, whether or not their kidneys are working and they've got an adequate urine output and whether they've got liver dysfunction. If you think about those things every day, then you won't miss 
a child who's deteriorating and you'll provide supportive care for the child uh, as they as they uh, as they recover in the in the first stages until the diagnosis is clear then giving keftriaxin and flucloxacillin will cover the gram positive bacteria that might be there but if you make a diagnosis of dengue and it looks just like dengue you don't need to keep going with the antibiotics unless there's some other evidence of a secondary bacterial infection which is actually not very common mostly mostly that that doesn't occur that's rare but but uh, mostly you can stop the antibiotics after 48 hours if the cultures are negative or if the child clearly has dengue and is making some uh, recovery um, if the child's only got fever then just encourage oral fluids make sure that you keep fluids up to them but if they've got severe dengue and they've got plasma leak into their extravascular compartment outside the outside the capillaries then they are likely to have intravascular volume depletion they, with the with that narrow pulse pressure they're likely to have a rapid low volume pulse and they may well have a coagulopathy because they're leaking plasma into their into their uh, tissues out from their uh, intravascular space and if you leak plasma you're also leaking clotting factors and they may also have thrombocytopenia. So their blood may not clot very well um, and they may be intravascularly volume deplete. So ideally you replace the deficit intravenously, but be quite careful about how much fluid you give these patients. You need to try to make their pulse pressure back towards normal and, um, and make sure they've got a perfusing blood pressure and try to keep their urine output going. In the in the um, convalescence stages, once they're improving, then they reabsorb that fluid back into the intravascular space, some of it anyway, and that can lead to a sense of fluid overload. They can be have excess um, uh, fluid in the intravascular space. Sometimes that will lead to the patient being fluid overload, and they'll have pulmonary edema. Um, and so in the convalescence uh, stage, you may need to stop giving large amounts of fluid and start giving diuretics so that they can diurese the fluid off. Usually in dengue shock, we use isotonic colloid, and that can mean, I think probably if you've got Hartman's solution, that would be the best sort of fluid to give. Um, if you haven't got that, normal saline is okay, but it tends to cause more acidosis. But your target should be about trying to normalize their pulse pressure and their blood pressure and prevent the signs of shock and to maintain a urine output. They're, they're the things you should focus on and, and correct their coagulopathy if they're bleeding. So um, if the child's got a pulse pressure of less than 20, then giving some fluids as a bolus is safe to do so. And then you reassess the circulation, their hands and feet, their pulse pressure, their pulse um, volume, and their capillary return. If they've got signs of severe thrombocytopenia or bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding or else, you give whole blood because that will contain both platelets and clotting factors. Uh, it'll contain uh, like the equivalent of fresh frozen plasma. If, if the child's bleeding and they've got a plate to count of less than 50,000, then you need to give them some platelets. And certainly if they've got a plate to count less than 10,000, then um, with any bleeding, I would uh, 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 transfuse platelets in those patients. Um, remember that the thrombocytopenia is partly due to, mostly due to the toxin, toxin effect of the... Um, uh, from the virus itself, and it does resolve over time. The coagulopathy may be due to the leakage of plasma, and that can be corrected with whole blood or fresh frozen plasma. Um, you just need to, it's a balance all the time between correcting these things and not making the child so um, uh, fluid overloaded and putting them into pulmonary edema. I, I, I mentioned a pulse pressure of 40 is about what to aim for. Less than 20 is too narrow. This is a normal pulse pressure for different ages. And uh, most children who get dengue, it's around about 35 to 40. Uh, obviously, for newborn babies, it's a bit less. 
and for adolescents, it's a bit more. But most most children have a pulse pressure of about 40 millimeters of mercury, the difference between their systolic and their diastolic pressure. And you can get a good idea of that by feeling a child's pulse, but also by measuring their, their blood pressure. Focus a lot on the pulse pressure when you're triaging patients and thinking about their circulation. I wanted to say something about acute kidney injury because it's I think it's unrecognized in many children with dengue, but it does, does occur in about 5%. There's many studies now looking at this in large populations of children with dengue, and it's somewhere between 1.6 and 5% of all children with severe dengue get an acute kidney failure. And um, if, I guess what we know from other forms of viremia or sepsis, that if and urea occurs if the child stops making urine, then they're at very high risk of death. And so we want to try to protect the child from uh, acute kidney injury in any form of sepsis state. In dengue, particularly, the, the acute kidney injury is due to several things. One, because they're hypotensive and they've got a narrow pulse pressure, because they've leaked all their fluid out into the extravascular space so that not as much blood perfuses the kidney. But also because in dengue you have a sort of myositis, an inflammation of the um, of the muscles, uh, it's a bit like with influenza and other other viruses that lead to myalgia or muscle aches and pains. Often there's a myositis, and in dengue sometimes that can be so severe you get what's called rhabdomyolysis, which means the the muscles break down, they release myoglobin and creatinine kinase, and that can cause tubular, it can cause an acute kidney injury, as can hemolysis. If the red cells are breaking down, then that can lead to, um, uh, again, a blockage of the renal tubules leading to acute kidney injury. And, and rarely in, in dengue, there are some children that can get like a glomerulonephritis, a bit like post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis with dengue. So there's lots of reasons why children might get acute kidney injury in dengue. And our job is to try to protect them from getting a worse kidney insult. And um, I mentioned earlier that more than half, about 70% of all children with dengue have proteinuria. And that's part of the reason why they, why they become so edematous, a bit like nephrotic syndrome, but also because they have these other kidney uh, manifestations, the rhabdomyolysis and and hemolysis, and sometimes a, a glomerulonephritis going on. So you need to monitor their urine output, children with dengue, and try to maintain a urine flow. It's very important they don't get anuric. Try to maintain a urine flow if you can. You should monitor patients in an ICU area in the ward where they can get close monitoring with a, a, a a monitoring chart like this that can where you can track their blood pressure and their pulse pressure and their heart rate and their oxygen saturations and their degree of respiratory distress, all of these things and and know whether the child's on the improve, improving or deteriorating. This is very important. For some children with dengue, they need um, extra support, such as um, CPAP if they've got pulmonary edema or rarely do they need drainage of their effusions. Usually you can diurese that fluid off. As they recover, their capillaries heal, the, the protein stays within the intravascular space and all that fluid gets absorbed or they, move, they diurese the, the fluid off their lungs. Um, sometimes you need to put in a, 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 an intercostal catheter to drain their, their pleural effusions, but, but mostly you just try to deal with their fluids by diuresis and uh, trying to get rid of their, their fluid. Um, don't give, if the child's in shock, if they've got a very narrow pulse pressure, then it's really important that you don't give diuretics because it can actually, a bit like in nephrotic syndrome, it can make their, their um, kidney failure and their hypotension worse. So it's best if you can restore their circulation and then give them diuretics to try to get, try to, try to achieve a, a good urine output uh, from then. Um, yeah. Okay, look, that's about all I wanted to say about dengue today.
I think that's I'm focused mostly on the the clinical features and also on the on the pathophysiology and the immunology and the differential diagnosis. I think they're the important things for clinicians to note. There's some other aspects of dengue that are interesting, like the like the new dengue vaccine and how that works and the problems that have occurred with that in the with the with the older dengue vaccine. They're, they're interesting and also some newer methods to control dengue, such as um, uh, the using a particular bacteria that can um, reduce the risk of the dengue, uh, uh, that, that can infect the Aedes aegypti and reduce the risk, the, the chance of it being able to, um, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to carry dengue. So there are some um, there are some interesting ways in which people have tried to control dengue in recent years. Um, but uh, the main things I wanted you to know about today were the, um, the, the diagnosis, the differential diagnosis, the pathology and the Im immunology and the clinical features and, and how to manage dengue. So that's all I want to say today. I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions that you might have.